So hello, I'm happy that you all made it on the uh, rainy night for for our talk. I'm I'm Dr. Andrew Werman. I'm assistant professor of colonial early American history in the history department at CMU, and uh, welcome to our William T. Bolger lecture in American biography. And before I introduce tonight's speaker, I thought I should speak for a moment about. Uh, William Bolger, a man some in this, in this room uh, knew and, and loved. Uh, Bill Bolger came to the history department at Central Michigan in 1958 and taught on a number of so subjects for ultimately landing on uh, my own uh, topic of interest, colonial and revolutionary America. He taught thousands of students during his career at, at CMU. Many of them considered him their favorite. He took a personal interest in them. And Bill died of, of cancer in, in 2012, and his friends and colleagues in the history department and loved ones uh, endowed this lecture series on American biography, a subject that he enjoyed. Uh, and, and, and tonight, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our Bolger lecturer, Dr. Daniel Feller. Dr. Feller comes, from, comes to us from the University of Tennessee, where he's a professor and uh, professor of history and editor and director of the papers of Andrew Jackson uh, since 2003. The papers of Andrew Jackson is a project to collect and publish Jackson's entire literary record. Uh, the project is producing a series of 17 volumes that will bring Jackson's most important papers to the public. Volumes 1 through 10 have been published. The project has now moved in the Jackson second term in office. Um, I'll also add, uh, uh, for no particular reason, that the papers of Andrew Jackson have been supported by grants from the National Endowment of the Humanities. Um, in his own work, Dr. Feller has moved beyond uh, Jackson himself to study mid-19th century America as a, as a whole with special attention to uh, Jacksonian politics and the coming of the Civil War. He's written two books on the period, The Public Lands and Jacksonian Politics, and the Jacksonian Promise, America, 1815 to 1840. Now that book, The Jacksonian Promise, was assigned in the very first history class that I took as an undergraduate at the University of Arkansas. And I won't mention what year that was because I've only managed to make Dan look old. Um, <laughs> uh, Dan has also written numerous book chapters and articles. Uh, the, in the Journal of American History, the Journal of, America, Journal of the Early American Republic, among others. He's appeared as an expert commentator on a couple of my favorite programs, PBS's The History Detectives, as well as uh, the radio show and podcast Backstory. And tonight, for the Bolger Lecture in American Biography, we get a bit of a two-for-one. He'll speak to us about two of America's most controversial figures. Uh, the title of his talk is Andrew Jackson and Donald Trump, Outsiders Alike. And with that. Well, thank you for that. Can everybody hear me? For that encouraging round of applause, I ought to quit while I'm ahead. It'll only get worse from here. Uh, thank you, all of you, for coming out on this rather dismal uh, evening. And thank you to Central Michigan University, to the History Department, to my uh, gracious host, uh, uh, Dr. Werman, to the wonderful graduate students I met this afternoon, uh, and to anyone who has contributed or might consider contributing to the Bulger Fund uh, so that you can see lectures next year that will be better than this one. Uh, with that as preface, let me begin. By the way, there's a question mark at the end of that title. Uh, uh, it, it, outsiders alike, question mark. Uh, and let me begin by quoting three assessments of a certain former president. And the first is by a renowned historian, and it sets the scene at this former president's inauguration. And I'm quoting all of this. The retiring president put on a brave front, masking his dejection under frigid smiles. Uncertainty about the future increased the official gloom in Washington. One senator said, the president-elect will be here soon. Nobody knows what he'll do when he does come. 
My opinion is that when he comes, he will bring a breeze with him. Which way it'll blow, I cannot tell. My fear is stronger than my hope. End of that quote, but still quoting the historian. From faraway states, the people came to Washington. Local politicians, newspaper editors, war veterans, curiosity seekers, and just plain people. Their hope was stronger than their fear. The young republic faced its critical test. Could it survive the rule of the people? The new president grew visibly from the day of his inauguration. His leadership gained steadily in confidence and imagination. He grew stronger after every contact with the people. In the last analysis, there lay the source of his strength, his deep mutual understanding of the people. The people called him, and he came like the great folk heroes to lead them out of captivity and bondage. That's one quotation, and here for balance are two other less glittering assessments of that same president. Uh, the first, near the end of his eight years in office, from this president's leading opponent in Congress. He is felt from one extremity to the other of this vast republic. He exercises uncontrolled the power of the state. In one hand, he holds the purse, and in the other, brandishes the sword. Myriads of dependents and partisans scattered over the land are ever ready to sing hosannas to him and to laud to the skies whatever he does. He is swept over the government like a tropical tornado. Every department exhibits traces of the ravages of the storm. What object of his ambition is unsatisfied? What more does he want? Must we blot, deface, and mutilate the records of the country to punish the presumptuousness of expressing an opinion contrary to his own? And then one last assessment of this same president some years later, a studied reflection from a later biographer. He appears always to have meant well, but his ignorance of law, history, politics, science, of everything which he who governs a country ought to know, was extreme. His ignorance was as a wall around about him, high and impenetrable. He was imprisoned in his ignorance, and sometimes raged around his little dim enclosure like a tiger in his den. Now, the president we're talking about in all three of these is, of course, Abraham Lincoln. No, you're all right. It, <laughs> it's Andrew Jackson. Uh, the first passage comes from Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s Age of Jackson, uh, a monumental work that won a Pulitzer Prize when it was published in 1945 and is still worth reading today. Uh, the second is from an 1837 Senate speech by Jackson's arch antagonist, Henry Clay. And the third one is from a book called The Life of Andrew Jackson, published in 1860 by James Parton, uh, Jackson's first and I still think best scholarly biographer. But do these passages, in particular the first admiring one from Schlesinger, do they also describe another president? Do they also describe Donald Trump? Well, certainly the president and some of his closest associates would have it so. Uh, even before the election, as you probably know, a flood of pronouncements from people close to Mr. Trump, uh, Newt Gingrich, Rudy Giuliani, Steve Bannon, made the parallel with Jackson explicit. And after the election, the new president himself embraced it. With great fanfare, he procured a portrait of Andrew Jackson and mounted it strategically right above his Oval Office desk, where, by design, it appears in every official photograph of the president at work. By the way, uh, Jackson portraits have been put up and taken down and put up and taken down in the Oval Office over the years. Uh, and the repeated putting up and taking down, if you look at the years, uh, offers a fascinating and rather precise charting of Andrew Jackson's uh, reputation as it has fallen and sunk. Uh, and then, less than three weeks ago, opportunely for my purpose today, on the occasion of Andrew Jackson's 250th birthday, President Trump visited the Hermitage, which is Jackson's plantation home uh, in suburban Nashville and is now a noteworthy historic site. The president toured the home, 
laid a wreath at Jackson's to tomb and gave a short but very pointed speech in which he cast himself item by item as the political rebirth of Andrew Jackson. Now there is from one point of view nothing new or unusual in any of this. Uh, every president, including Jackson, has invoked illustrious predecessors to bolster his own legitimacy. And each one of them has picked certain aspects to dwell on and others to ignore. Ronald Reagan, for instance, extolled Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman for their war and Cold War leadership, uh, but not for their creation of a national welfare state. Going back further, Abraham Lincoln and his Republican Party during the Civil War often invoked Andrew Jackson's example. But the Jackson that they called in to fortify their cause was Jackson the champion of union against nullification and secession. Not another Jackson, not Jackson the high-handed, veto-mongering, anti-bank, anti-tariff, anti-internal improvement presidential tyrant. That was the Jackson that Abraham Lincoln, a lifelong Whig party man and an acolyte of Henry Clay, that was the Andrew Jackson that up till the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln had spent his entire political career denouncing. Further, Claiming the legacy of Andrew Jackson has a certain obvious utility for somebody in Donald Trump's particular circumstances. Put yourself in his shoes. You're a political newcomer. You've been elected by a modest electoral college majority, despite what you or anyone else might say. It was a modest majority. And against a clear popular majority. Much of the existence, existing political establishment fears and despises you. Your presidency needs validation and legitimacy, if not from the people in that establishment, then against them. In Andrew Jackson, if you look back, you know, who can you seize upon? In Andrew Jackson, you've got an example of a genuine great popular hero, also an outsider, also hated and feared by many in Washington, but who, Jackson, nonetheless was swept into office on a wave of grassroots enthusiasm with a landslide majority in both the popular and major, uh, uh, electoral vote, four years later re-elected by an even more overwhelming margin. Jackson famously championed the common folk against the elites, won all his political battles, and in winning became himself an emblem, even embodiment of democracy. What's not to like here? What politician would not want to wrap himself in this mantle? Well, at the Hermitage three weeks ago, President Trump made all these parallels explicit. And let me quote you some of his words, and I'm Everything I'm about to quote you is stuff he said at the Hermitage, including the asides. Jackson confronted and defied an arrogant elite. Does that sound familiar to you? I wonder why they keep talking about Trump and Jackson, Jackson and Trump. Oh, I know the feeling, Andrew. Jackson rejected authority that looked down on the common people. Jackson's victory shook the establishment like an earthquake. Henry Clay called it mortifying and sickening. Oh boy, does this sound familiar. Have we heard this? The political class in Washington had good reason to fear Jackson's great triumph because Andrew Jackson was the people's president. All of that is a quote from Donald Trump. Well, President Trump has cast himself as an outsider, an insurgent, a disruptor, the plain spoken champion of the common people against the entrenched interests and it is accurate in a general way to say that Andrew Jackson pioneered all of those presidential roles. Still in some ways Jackson seems a very odd and risky choice for a political model. Now presidents used to visit the Hermitage with some frequency uh, for Democrats and remember that Jackson founded the Democratic Party. Uh, for Democrats, a hermitage visit, uh, visit was kind of like a pilgrimage, you know, to pay homage uh, to the man who created the Democratic Party. Uh, as you may know, the leading event on the Democratic Party's annual calendar is something that used to be, and in some places still is, called Jefferson Jackson Day. Yet it has been 35 years since a president came to the hermitage, until this 
last visit. The last visitor before Donald Trump in 2017 was Ronald Reagan in 1982. And it has been 50 years, a full half century, since the last Democratic president came, uh, Lyndon Johnson in 1967. You notice who didn't come, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama. That's not because they weren't invited. On Jackson's birthday, every president automatically gets an invitation to go to the Hermitage. It's because Andrew Jackson's reputation has not been very high of late. Uh, in fact, it has been so low, as I'm sure you all know, that last year the Treasury Department, President Obama's Treasury Department, announced Jackson's pending demotion uh, from the place of honor on the $20 bill. Now, see, notice who they decided to kick off the currency. Not George Washington, not Thomas Jefferson, not Abraham Lincoln, not Alexander Hamilton, not Ben Franklin, and not even Ulysses S. Grant. Andrew Jackson. And while there was some squawking about that decision, not much of it came from Democrats. Outside, I should make an exception of Nashville. Nashville, Tennessee is Jackson's hometown. Uh, the political establishment there is a Democratic, but he's a hometown boy. So they weren't happy uh, to see Jackson being kicked off the 20. But outside of that, there was very little squawking from Democrats. The Democratic Party today is, in a word, embarrassed by Jackson. And everybody knows why. If some previous generations of Americans knew Jackson as the defender of the Union, or the champion of the little guy, recently we, recently we have come to know him mainly as a slave owner and especially as the architect of Indian removal. This is the Jackson that school textbooks for a generation now have emphasized most. And today, and I can say this from experience because I meet people and, uh, you know, what do you do? I work on Andrew Jackson. Oh boy, that guy hated Indians. That's what comes right back. Uh, today, more Americans instinctively associate Jackson's name with the Cherokee Trail of Tears than with his bank veto or nullification or even the Battle of New Orleans. Before the Trump camp resuscitated it, the image of Jackson as popular hero and emblem of democracy had been almost completely displaced, at least in many circles, by Jackson as America's archetypal racist, a practitioner of ethnic cleansing, if not of outright genocide, and also as something close to a homicidal maniac. Indeed, Jackson's reputation had sunk so late that it was cons uh, of late that it was considered, it has become considered uh, acceptable in enlightened liberal quarters to accuse Jackson of almost anything. For instance, pushing for Jackson's removal from the $20 bill back in 2015, the New York Times, and this is the New York Times, not an op-ed column on the New York Times, but the actual an editorial, the Times editorial board speaking for itself, <coughs> excuse me, charged that, and now I'm going to quote, Jackson's decisions annihilated American Indian tribes of the Southeast. Think of that word annihilated for a moment. I think that means he killed them all off. Uh, and regardless of what you think of Indian removal, of which, by the way, I am no defender, uh, to say that Jackson killed them all off is a considerable exaggeration, both of intent and result. Uh, in June 2016, a cover story in the Atlantic magazine, and this was one of the first to pitch the Jackson-Trump analogy long before the Trump people themselves picked it up. Uh, a cover story in the Atlantic Magazine baldly stated, and I'm quoting again, Jackson fought at least 14 duels in his life. 14. The actual known number is one. Count them, one. It's a rather famous duel, but it's only one. Well, needless to say, in embracing Jackson at the Hermitage, President Trump did not mention slavery or Indian removal. Those were not part of the legacy that he was embracing. Uh, and yet, because of this darker, less savory side of Jackson's reputation, Trump's critics have been just as eager as he is to cast him in Jackson's mold. Uh, the message, in so many words, is, you want Andrew Jackson? You can have him. He's yours. 
Some have even drawn parallels between Jackson's Indian removal policy and Trump's immigration ban. Now, I thought those were pretty far-fetched parallels myself until startlingly just two weeks ago. Some Trump supporters, uh, including Mike Huckabee and Breitbart News, urged the president to go, and these are Breitbart's words, go full Andrew Jackson and defy the courts over immigration just as Jackson supposedly did over Indian removal. They were making this parallel explicit. Now, to be fair, the Trump White House itself has said nothing of the kind. So for very different reasons, and this is what I'm heading to, people on both sides of the partisan divide have seen advantage in likening Andrew Jackson to Donald Trump. But this speaks only to the political utility for both Republicans and Democrats of the comparison between the two. What about its actual historical accuracy? Now, many of the Jackson-Trump analogies that have been drawn by both parties, uh, most especially by uh, pundits and commentators, are simply insubstantial. Uh, factoids and trivia, parlor game stuff, you know, they both had good hair. Uh, the, the kind of parallels that you could draw between almost any two presidents taken at random, I'm not going to waste your time with those. Uh, beyond that, let me voice a caution. As a I hope, well-trained historian. I'm very reticent to draw analogies or parallels between past and present events or personalities. And many good historians share that reluctance. That might surprise some of you. You might think, as many people out there who are not as enlightened as you, uh, as many people out there do, that doing that is exactly what historians are supposed to do. Uh, to tell us, in this particular case, whether Donald Trump is really just like Andrew Jackson or not. But that is not how many historians actually think. They do believe history can be useful, but they see its usefulness not in pointing out parallels or par prototypes and saying, ha ha, we've seen this guy before, or something like this has just ha happened just before, uh, but rather in tracing connections in showing how what happened in the past helps explain how we got to where we are today. Historians know that despite that famous quote which we all hate, history does not repeat itself. It presents continuities, but never identities. There are threads connecting past and present, but they don't run straight. They merge and diverge and cross and interweave. Tracing out those threads is the historian's true calling. We look to the past for antecedents, but not so much for analogies, for origins, but not for identities, for perspective, but not for prescription. So, to state the obvious, 2016 is not 1828, and Donald Trump is not Andrew Jackson. Are there similarities between them? Certainly. But there are differences, too, differences in the men and differences in the times. As an example of differences in the times, I have been asked several times whether Andrew Jackson demonized the media the same way that Donald Trump does, to which I can only answer, what media are you talking about? There were, of course, newspapers in Jackson's day, but obviously no TV, no radio, no, no Twitter. Uh, but the press as we know it today, ostensibly independent, objective, neutral, professionalized. In Andrew Jackson's day, it simply didn't exist. Newspapers served as publicity arms of the politicians and parties. There was no ostensibly neutral press. Jackson had his own paper in Washington. Did he demonize it? No. Did he demonize papers that were against him? Yes. Surprise, surprise. So the question is essentially unanswerable because it presumes wrongly an unchanging news media over time. Well, let me tackle, I don't want to disappoint you, let me tackle some of the more obvious and often stated comparisons between Jackson and Trump. Uh, I said that Jackson was the prototypical outsider president, the original disruptor, uh, and indeed he was in running as a plain man of the people against the insider elites, he established a template that many 
would follow afterwards. Not just Donald Trump, but a lot of others before Donald Trump. Old Hickory, first presidential candidate with a nickname, Old Hickory Andrew Jackson, set the pattern for Old Tippecanoe William Henry Harrison, Old Rough and Ready Zachary Taylor, Old Honest Abe, you notice a kind of pattern here, they gotta be old. Uh, old Honest Abe the Rail Splitter, and of course that's Abraham Lincoln. By the way, I grew up with these stories about Honest Abe the Rail Splitter scratching his lessons on a back of a shovel by, by fireside at his log cabin. It wasn't until I became a historian that I realized that all this was campaign propaganda, it was made up out of nowhere, including Honest Abe the Rail Splitter. It's a campaign image. Does Donald Trump follow in this vein? Sort of. Political outsider and disruptor he is and proud of it. A war hero? Not so much. Uh, a self-made man born in a log cabin? Not so much. But really in terms of background, I would say that Trump has not so much followed a pattern as broken the mold. Andrew Jackson was considered an outsider when he ran for president, and by the way, one thing we do nowadays often is we collapse his two elections. Uh, Jackson ran for president in 1824 and lost. He ran again in 1828 and won. When he ran the first time in 24, uh, he was considered an outsider for two reasons. The first was his temperament, and I'll say a bit more about that later on. The second was his lack of experience in diplomacy and statecraft. Now today we'd say a big deal. You know, we have a lot of politicians who uh, grow up to be presidential timber who don't know much about foreign policy. Uh, their, their, their selling point is, is domestic policy. They pick up a little foreign policy along the way. It's true of Barack Obama. Had essentially no record in foreign affairs. But that, it was a different story back in the early days of the Republic. Uh, at that time, experience in diplomacy seemed essential because the United States, going all the way back to the Revolution, had been basically a pawn in a European power game. At that time, navigating foreign affairs was literally vital to the country's survival. All of Jackson's six predecessors as president came well fitted for the task. The four that immediately preceded him had all been Secretary of State before they became president. The one before those four, we're back to president number two, John Adams, uh, had played a crucial diplomatic role in and after the American Revolution, and the president before that was George Washington. By comparison to those people, Jackson had no prior diplomatic experience to speak of, and in some eyes that simply disqualified him for the presidency. But he was certainly no newcomer to politics. In fact, he had been in public service almost his entire adult life. He had held a long list of posts in all three branches of government and four, if you count the military. He'd been a state district attorney, then a state Supreme Court judge. He had been Tennessee's first congressman. He had served parts of two terms in the United States Senate. He had been the federal governor of Florida Territory. And for some years, he had been the second highest ranking general in the United States Army. As we know, Donald Trump, before he was elected last year, had never held or stood for public office in his life whether for good or ill. There's no precedent for that. Not Jackson, not nobody. Uh, even Ronald Reagan, who also ran as an outsider, by the way, as did Jimmy Carter, uh, and was widely derided uh, by some as a mere Hollywood actor, uh, by the time he became president, Ronald Reagan had been governor of the largest state in the Union for eight years, and, like Jackson, had already run for president once and lost before he finally won. So much for experience. As for temperament, this opens up a whole can of worms. We obviously cannot compare anybody to Andrew Jackson until, we sure, until we're sure we understand Jackson himself. And that presents a problem. The general public today, I think, seems to hold a pretty clear image of Jackson. They think they know who Jackson is. I will call that image Two-Gun Andy. Uh, 
this is Andrew Jackson, the fighter, the brawler, the plain spoken, no nonsense, I'll do things my way kind of guy. Fellow who don't take no guff from nobody, leastwise Congress or the courts. Quick draw artist with a hot temper and a high sense of honor who'll blow your head off if you insult his wife. Gunslinger who rides into town to clean up the mess and clear out the crooks. Show those prissy elites who's boss. It is no surprise uh, that Charlton Heston made a whole movie career playing Andrew Jackson, as he did in one film after another. You know, this is Charlton Heston's typecast character. Now, that's Two Gun Andy. Now, there is within the historical record some evidence to sustain to sustain the portrait of Two Gun Andy. Jackson's re record before he became president was strewn, indeed with quarrels and fights. There's no question he had a violent temper. The time of his inauguration, he carried two bullets in his body, one from that duel where he shot and killed his opponent after his opponent plunked him in the chest, uh, and the other from a pistol and knife melee in Nashville uh, during the War of 1812 that reads like something right out of gunfight at the OK Corral. Uh, where Jackson took a bullet in his arm, actually two bullets in his arm, uh, at point-blank range. James Parton, the biographer I quoted earlier describing Jackson as pacing back and forth in the cage of his own ignorance, uh, Parton concluded this about Jackson. Andrew Jackson was a fighting man, a little more than a fighting man. He hated the Whig Party much, but Henry Clay more. Nullification much but John C. Calhoun more. The Bank of the United States much, but Nicholas Biddle more. He was a thoroughgoing human fighting cock. And according to Cart Parton and many others, the way to understand Andrew Jackson, the way to understand his policies, is simply figure out who he hated. This is the Jackson who, I'm going to read you two famous quotes. The first one is, my only regret in life is that I did not shoot Henry Clay and hang John C. Calhoun. And the second quote, one you've probably all heard, uh, when the Supreme Court blocked his Indian removal policy, Jackson replied defiantly, John Marshall, Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall's made his decision, now let him enforce it. Now. Neither of those two quotations is, in fact, authentic. And Two-Gun Andy is, at best, an oversimplified caricature of Jackson even before he became president to say nothing of him as president. Some historians, most notably Arthur Schlesinger, who I quoted at the beginning, have indeed argued that Jackson, by the time of his election, had obtained perfect control of his temper, and used his hothead reputation with shrewd calculation for political effect. Underneath it all, said Schlesinger, Jackson was a perfectly cool customer and a much savvier political operator than we've given him credit for. Well, in fact, this question of Jackson's character or temperament is deeply contested by historians, just as it was by his contemporaries. There's good evidence on both sides, and you can, and historians do, argue the case either way. Still, many Americans, including some who should know better, have blindly accepted uh, the two-gun Andy image, bought it lock, stock, and barrel, facts and evidence be damned. This is where we get the notion that Jackson killed all the Indians, as the New York Times thinks, uh, or fought at least 14 duels. Writing recently as another example in New York Magazine, uh, liberal commentator Jonathan Chait uh, declared that Jackson opposed nullification, these are Chait's words, not out of any larger principle, but just out of a domineering instinct that made him lash out instinctively at any threat to his authority. Having myself read through the many pages of detailed constitutional exposition that Jackson wrote against nullification over a period of many months. Uh, I can say, I think, with some certainty uh, that the idea that it was all a domineering instinct and lashing out instinctively uh, is just absolute poppycock. 
Well, one can readily understand why President Trump's critics would seize upon headstrong, violent, two-gun Andy uh, as a prototype for Donald Trump. Uh, what's interesting is that the president and his camp have embraced it as well, at least to a certain extent. Uh, for a president whose chief advisor, Steve Bannon, has avowed the aim of busting up the status quo, destroying the Washington establishment, two-gun Andy has his uses. Uh, as an example, take Jackson's patronage policy, his infamous so-called spoil system of purging political opponents from government offices uh, and doling those offices out as rewards for his friends. This is not something that Jackson's modern defenders, and he has some, uh, usually choose to bring up. They consider it like Indian removal as a stain on his record, uh, something to be excused or explained away or politely ignored, but not President Trump. At the Hermitage, he said, and I'm quoting, to clean out the federal bureaucracy, Jackson removed 10% of the federal workforce. That sounds very familiar. Wait till you see what's going to be happening pretty soon, folks. It's time. Well, in assimilating himself to Jackson at the Hermitage, President Trump said one last thing that was striking. Quote, Jackson imposed tariffs on foreign countries to protect American workers. That statement is striking because it is spectacularly false. Whether or not you liked his spin on it, most of what the president said at the Hermitage about Jackson that day was historically sound, or at least arguably so. His direct quotations from Jackson, and he quoted him twice, were accurate. Uh, the staff work, and I say staff work because uh, there have been several indications that President Trump may not know actually a whole lot of American history. He seems to have recently discovered that Abraham Lincoln was a Republican and, and uh, thinks that other people didn't know that. Uh, you're all familiar probably with his apparent belief that Frederick Douglass is, is still around and doing good things. Uh, the staff work in this speech was generally good. Uh, whether or not the president knew what he was saying, he got somebody put text in front of him that was accurate. Uh, but to say that Jackson imposed tariffs, Trump's words, is exactly backwards. Leaving aside the picky detail that it's Congress, not the president, that levies taxes, Jackson, in fact, called insistently for tariff reduction. He came into office as a moderate defender of the existing protective duties, but soon repudiated that position, and in fact, opposing protective tariffs became a core element in his uh, policy and in his party's philosophy, the Democratic Party philosophy, throughout the whole rest of the 19th century. Well, unlike with the question of Jackson's temperament, there's no ambiguity or no disagreement here among historians. There's no reputable scholar that you could get this wrong fact from. It's possible that the president's speechwriter just plain goofed. But there is also perhaps an alternative explanation, one that may shed light also on that earlier question of why, out of all the models available to him, some of them much less controversial, President Trump and his camp have chosen Andrew Jackson as their model. Back in the year 2000, 17 years ago, a professor and pundit named Walter Russell Mead published an article uh, called The Jacksonian Tradition in an opinion journal called The National Interest. Meade identified four persistent strains in American character and outlook, which he labeled as Hamiltonian, Jeffersonian, Wilsonian, and Jacksonian. Jacksonians, said Meade, are fiercely nationalist and chauvinist. They're rugged frontier individuals, Individualists, they are protective of kin and clan. They honor tradition. They love guns. They despise strange notions and strange people, especially immigrants, especially those they consider to be sexual deviants, and especially economic and cultural elites who claim to be better than they are. Meade said that Jacksonians view the world outside them with suspicion. In war, they are utterly ruthless, 
They aim not just to defeat enemies, but to extinguish them. They love military spending, but they hate foreign aid. They think American diplomacy should be, and these are Meade's words, cunning, forceful, and no more scrupulous than anybody else's. They have little regard for international law and international institutions. Instead, they believe it would be best if every country, like a family, just looked out for itself. They see relations between nations as not inherently cooperative, but competitive, or even hostile. And therefore they are, and these are Meade's words, instinctively protectionist, seeking trade privileges for US goods abroad and hoping to withhold those privileges from foreign goods at home. And Meade concluded by saying this Jacksonian mindset is, and these are his words, an expression of the social, cultural, and religious values of a large portion of the American public. And yet, he said, people in the media and the professoriate, like me, tend to overlook or miscomprehend these Jacksonians because we never meet any in our own lives. There aren't any of them among us. Now, a knowledgeable historian would have fit with, fits with this essay. Meade is not himself a historian, though he has been billed as such, and his use of history is clever but undisciplined. Uh, as historical analysis, the essay is rife with confusion and error. Most centrally, Meade never explains why he calls this outlook that I've just described to you Jacksonian. While a lot of it sounds like Tugan Andy that I was talking about earlier, its connection to the real Andrew Jackson is tenuous at best. In the area of foreign affairs, which is curiously Meade's specialty, the policy, la policy he labels as Jacksonian has almost no resemblance to Andrew Jackson's. Take one example. Uh, Jackson's policy toward Great Britain, uh, a nation which, remember, he had fought against in two wars, the American Revolution and the War of 1812, uh, and the American Revolution, a war in which he had lost his entire family. So he had kind of reason to not like the British. And remember that Meade says the Jacksonian attitude in foreign policy is chauvinistic and belligerent. Well, in fact, Jackson's policy as president toward Great Britain was so conciliatory on issues of trade and of territory that his political opponents charged him with humiliating the country in his haste to capitulate to British demands. The real Jackson was not an instinctive protectionist. He was a free trader and an internationalist who sought to lower, not raise, international trade barriers and who gloried in the spread of what he called, and these are his words, rational liberty and representative government to the world. Not for nothing was Jackson close friends with the Marquis de Lafayette who we think of at the time of the Revolution, but was still alive in the 1820s and into the 30s, a good friend of Jackson's. Uh, Lafayette, uh, in his later years, was a champion and living emblem of the global progress of liberty and democracy. And he and Jackson exchanged letters during Jackson's presidency, charting that global progress of liberty and democracy. Well, but as you may have noticed, if Walter Russell Meade's Jacksonianism has almost nothing to do with the real Jackson. It has everything to do with Donald Trump, whose presidency it almost precisely predicts. Uh, and indeed, Meade's foresight can be almost spooky. For instance, in his essay, he says that Jacksonians used to be Democrats, but now they're becoming Republicans. This is in the year 2000. He wrote this 17 years ago. The Trump camp, my point is, is getting its ideas about Andrew Jackson from somewhere. You could never get the idea that Andrew Jackson was a tariff protectionist by actually looking at his record. But you would get precisely that idea by reading Walter Russell Meade. Trump and his people say that they are embracing Andrew Jackson. What they're really embracing is a bundle of traits that have been lumped together and loosely branded as Jacksonian. And that bundle of traits, as laid out in Meade's essay, matches Trump's policies so precisely 
that it appears that the, the Trump administration is not merely invoking Jackson's presidency, or rather Meade's version of it, as a model. It's using it as a playbook. Now, of course it's possible uh, that these ideas might have been picked up by the Trump camp from someone other than Meade, or picked up indirectly rather than directly. Normally you're thinking, uh, and correctly so, it's the height of folly to say that a whole presidential agenda can be traced back to an academic essay, uh, especially in an administration that has as much contempt uh, for academia as this one seems to. And yet Meade's essay has been vastly influential over the years, especially in conservative circles and among political pundits. Uh, on January 20th, of this year, which was Donald Trump's inauguration day, a big Washington Post story on the inauguration discussed Walter Russell Meade at length, and that very day, Meade himself updated his 2000 essay uh, in a piece for a conservative think tank called the Hudson Institute. So where does this leave us? Let us stress again that Jackson, like other presidents, left many legacies, not just the one that's been labeled Jacksonian, and that President Trump has embraced. And those legacies themselves can be turned in multiple directions. Take, for instance, Jackson's championship of the common people against the elites. At the Hermitage, Donald Trump quoted correctly, the signature line of Andrew Jackson's signature policy statement, and that was his veto of the Bank of the United States in 1832. And that signature line is this. It is to be regretted that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. It's to be regretted that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. Remember that phrase, rich and powerful. That's a potent statement. But who exactly are the rich and powerful? Uh, President Trump didn't say. Uh, to him, they appear to be rather vaguely the elites and insiders, the academics like me, uh, the alligators in the swamp that he's promised to drain. Uh, but to Jackson, they were more specifically bankers. In words that former generations of Democratic Party politicians loved to quote, Jackson denounced the special privilege and leverage that banks and corporations enjoyed in Washington. Let me quote you one passage. This is from Andrew Jackson's farewell address in 1837 on leaving the presidency. One of the serious evils of our present system of banking is that it enables one class of society to act injuriously upon the interests of all the others and to exercise more than its just proportion of influence in political affairs. The agricultural, the mechanical, and the laboring classes have little or no share in the direction of the great moneyed corporations. The planter, the farmer, the mechanic, and the laborer are the bone and sinew of the country. Yet they are in constant danger of losing their fair influence in the government. And with difficulty, they maintain their rights against this moneyed interest. Unless you check the spirit of, spirit of monopoly and thirst for exclusive privileges, you will find in the end that the most important powers of government have been given or bartered away, and the control over your dearest interest has passed in the hands of those corporations. This is Andrew Jackson in 1837. Who claims that legacy? Let me read you one more quote. This will be the last this is a recent speaker. Who does Congress work for? Does it work for the millionaires, the billionaires, the giant companies with their armies of lobbyists and lawyers? Or does it work for all the people? If big companies can deploy armies of lobbyists and lawyers to get the Congress to vote for special deals that benefit themselves, then we simply confirm the view that the system is rigged. And now the Congress is about to show us the worst of government for the rich and powerful. This is a democracy, and the American people did not elect us to stand up for big banks. They elected us to stand up for all the people. Now, 
Once again, there are no identities, <laughs> but that's remarkably similar to what Andrew Jackson said in 1837. Anybody want to guess who I was quoting there? Can't hear you. Bernie Sanders is close. What was the other one? It is Elizabeth Warren. Yes, it is Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren, Democratic senator from Massachusetts and a fierce critic of the Trump administration. Uh, the speech I was quoting was on December 10th, 2014. Uh, she was attacking the rollback of the Dodd-Frank uh, banking regulations in that year's uh, budget bill. Uh, and indeed, Warren's language, on, when I looked at that speech, by the way, when it, when it came out, I saw it on YouTube. And I thought, this whole thing is taken from Jackson's bank veto and farewell address. It practically was. Uh, and in fact, her language on that occasion and many other occasions since has echoed Jackson's language so closely that it is literally true that if you cut her speeches up into little snippets and cut Jackson's bank veto and farewell address up into little snippets and like throw them into a, a, a basket and pick them out, you know, you can't tell which is which. Now, my point is not that Elizabeth Warren is the reincarnation of Andrew Jackson uh, any more than Donald Trump is. Uh, the Jacksonian echoes in her speeches, I think, are entirely unintentional, though I'm curious, you know, whether anybody's actually said to her, do you realize that Andrew Jackson said almost those exact same words? Uh, rather, the point, again, is to beware of glib and false analogies. No one knows what time will bring, least of all those who say they do. At its end, will Donald Trump's presidency look like Andrew Jackson's? Or like Richard Nixon's, as some are predicting? Or like Ronald Reagan's? Or like nobody's? It's too early to tell. Events have a way of surprising us. Still, if it does not predict the future, history can at least offer some perspective on the past. And I will offer a perspective that you will either find deflating or consoling, uh, depending upon your political point of view. In 1828, when he was elected, and by the way, his election in 1828 was no surprise to anybody. It is true that Jackson was an outsider, an upstart candidate with surprising popular support when he ran and lost in 1824. He was the odds-on favorite in 1828, uh, and indeed, the election wasn't close. And the incumbent president, John Quincy Adams, knew he was going to lose long before the vote came. In 1828, Andrew Jackson's supporters hailed his election as the salvation of the republic. They really thought it was. And his opponents, including Henry Clay, decried Jackson's election as the end of the world. And they really thought it was. In retrospect, both judgments were overblown. So will the Trump presidency prove such a decisive revolution as its supporters hope and its critics fear? The prudent historian says, wait and see. Thank you very much. Do we have some time for questions? Uh, we have a little bit of time. We have a little bit of time. Sorry. Uh, and, and because uh, we're, we're recording this, we'll put it on, on YouTube, the OAH. And I will restate webs the questions. Website. Um, or are you going to uh, I'm going to take a take microphone, okay. uh, uh, Phil Donahue style. And, and uh, uh, so if you speak into it, then that way the, the camera can, can pick it up. So if you have questions. Okay, well, you can, you can shout if you like, but <laughs> be there momentarily. Where can we find the YouTube? It'll be posted. It's actually on the Department of website of the OAH, uh, oah.org. the risk of another uh, rather uh, stretched comparison, I wonder if you might just comment briefly on the kinds of notions that people have had, professional historians, about the Southern Code of Honor and 
that show up in, for instance, that article on the man who pulled Andrew Jackson's nose, and uh, the notion that uh, Trump has, let's say, an overly sensitive ego. Uh, gee, I'm not fam familiar with the article about the guy who pulled Jackson's nose. Uh, <coughs> This question came up the, 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 in terms of the temperament of the two. Basically, that's what you're asking. Uh, I don't see any similarity. Uh, for one thing, well, well, Donald Trump has, you know, he has, let's say he, he seems to have a short fuse. Uh, he hadn't hit anybody yet. Uh, <laughs> you know, he hasn't caned anybody yet. He hasn't uh, shot anybody yet. So. Uh, that's perhaps, you know, difference in the times and difference in the men. Uh, really with Jackson, I'm kind of, I hope to get around to answering your question. Uh, the basic question the historians have asked about uh, Jackson, going back to that part in quote, is uh, did he, granted that he personalized everything, is that all there was? Uh, and the answer to that, I think, having worked with his papers, is that, well, he certainly did personalize everything. Uh, he did, for instance, hate the Bank of the United States president, uh, the president of the Bank of the United States. He also had a very, a quite surprisingly deep grounding in policy. So, to me, that's, an, uh, I do not want to insult the president, and I don't want to suggest that he doesn't know what he's doing, but, but he himself has said in so many words, you don't have to study this stuff, you know. Uh, I don't need to read books. I, I, yeah, he suggested that the more you know about a subject, the less you might understand it. Uh, I don't see that in Jackson at all. Does that help? Or? Well, I, it was the issue of the Southern Honor Code. Oh, the issue, issue of the Southern Honor Code. Well, Jackson, Jackson definitely grew, grew, grew up within the Southern Honor Code. I don't know to what extent anyone would... would uh, Make a parallel between the Southern Honor Code that Jackson grew up with and whatever the honor quote is that you, you know that you use in the the real estate business uh, or the television business in late 20th, early 21st century New York. So I guess I just don't see any connection there. Uh, has the image of the uh, Two Gun Andy sort of uh, been stable throughout the years, or is that something that has developed in recent history or changed very rapidly? Uh, you know, throughout the uh, you know, rise and fall of various political needs? No, it's a good question, and it's always been there. I mean, I was quoting James Parton in 1860, saying, you know, Jackson was just a fighter, and, and basically he had no mind. That's what Parton was saying. It has, I think it's become more prevalent recently, and the surprising thing is that it's become prevalent among, within the party that he founded, where they used to talk in the same about Jackson as being, you know, the, the little guy against the banks. And now you have again leading Democrat, Demo, what I would call Democratic venues. I'm going to go ahead and call them that, uh, whether or not they identify themselves as such. You know, saying this guy was just a killer. Uh, so both sides, I think, in this in this discussion, are, are focusing on on Andrew Jackson. That that's a uh, at least half false image. You know, nobody seems to know their history right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still kind of putting this together in my head. In thinking back so with, I, um, yes, <laughs> with Schlesinger's portrayal of um, Jackson as kind of cool, calculating, but understanding his own two-gun Andy image at the time, using it during the bank war, mm -hmm. and definitely we see that during the bank veto, do you see comparisons there, possibly with Trump, being able to communicate with the people in such a way, channel the specific issues, speak in the way that they want to hear this, taking advantage of his own persona to pursue an agenda? Or is it too soon to tell? It's too soon to tell, but you may very well be right. Uh, there, <laughs> Uh, I, you come up here. You're better than me. Uh, I, I, th I think you could identify that as a similarity. Yeah. Now, the way he speaks to his own people uh, is different, but but 
there was this similarity, and I was kind of hinting that, at this at the end. Uh, Jackson's opponents, and this is true, were surprised and very distraught. By 1828, they knew they were going to lose. So they weren't surprised at that election, but they were aghast that they could lose that election. And they thought, how can the American, this was Henry Clay's, you know, tortured, uh, anguished expression. How could, how could they vote for this guy, you know? How can Americans possibly vote for this guy? Uh, when Clay ran against Jackson himself in 1832 and just got creamed, uh, and Clay wrote letters home saying, I might as well give up. You know, <laughs> this country's hopeless. Uh, a country that will vote for this baboon over me. Uh, there was, I think, if this is the point you're driving at, I think you're absolutely correct. And a lot of uh, Trump's opponents, you know, couldn't believe it, you know. How could you possibly believe this guy? Obviously, there is a connection that Trump is making to a constituency, just as Jackson was making to a constituency that the other side simply didn't understand or appreciate at all. How far we'll go, we'll see. Well said. Well, maybe we'll, we'll wrap up on that, uh, that note. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Dan Fowler and